I mean, do we need to have this conversation? Is this the best trilogy in the MCU? All right, so Guardians of the Galaxy, a film that debuted all the way back... <laughs> Wait, this says a decade ago. What the... <clears throat> so Guardians of the Galaxy, a film that debuted almost a decade ago, and even though you probably wouldn't guess it now, was a true trailblazer for its time. The MCU was really picking up speed at a rapid and groundbreaking pace with earlier and surrounding releases like Captain America Winter Soldier and Avengers Age of Ultron. The MCU seemingly could do no wrong at the time, but with that rapid growth comes rapid demand, so it was fairly noticeable at the time to us the audience that the MCU movies were starting to become formulaic in what we now deem as the MCU formula. And while in earlier phases sometimes that deemed formula would drag the movie down a couple pegs, say story beat wise, seeing how we've seen it over and over again, for the most part though, the MCU formula was a great success and worked out more often than not. Enter in the Guardians of the Galaxy, one of the most untraditional, ambitious, and as mentioned before, trailblazing films to not only be greenlit at Marvel for their introduction into the MCU, but it's pretty much easy to argue, especially at the time, one of the most untraditional, ambitious, and trailblazing films of the superhero genre as a whole. With director James Gunn held to lead the project, the film was set to be a character-driven story as we followed the intergalactic criminals from across the galaxy coming together as they set aside their differences to track down a MacGuffin, of course, a MacGuffin, and defeat the tyrannical warrior Ronin as he wants to destroy the universe. Sorry I said it like that. Back then, that wasn't so common. But what does that saying go? At the end, they just learned that friendship was the most important thing of all? Or maybe they learned that friendship was always just inside of them? Annabelle, what if there is no treasure? Perhaps the real treasure is true friendship and the spirit of adventure. Anyway, with the extreme success of the first Guardians of the Galaxy, and as mentioned before, with the rapid pace that the MCU was growing at the time, it was pretty inevitable that the Guardians of the Galaxy were not only going to be reoccurring characters throughout the future of the MCU, but characters that were deserving and earned their right to tell their own story. And well, we're finally here at the conclusion of that story. I think. With that, I think Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was... pretty great. And sad. If you're even somewhat familiar with how the beats and the tones of how these Guardians of the Galaxy movies typically go, then yeah, it's pretty much just that for a third time. So rather that tickles your fancy or not, that's what you should expect. And while that's rather a simplified version of breaking down what really isn't the MCU formula, but more of what I would say is the James Gunn formula, the differentiating tones in this movie, while mostly the same as the first two, are pretty much amped up to the most extreme levels in Volume 3. Let me explain. The story is yet again, and I do say that with the highest of praise, another character-driven story, much like Guardians of the Galaxy 2 with Quill learning his origins and who his father is. Volume 3 follows the story of Rocket, the fan beloved raccoon whose dark backstory has been hinted at with ever so slight clues throughout the duration of the first two, but was never explored in much detail. And in reality, some would say that backstory was much overdue, but never did I really think, or I guess really expect, how dark it would actually get. But we'll get to that. When it comes to the plot, the story is pretty much just a rescue mission for Rocket, following an attack by Adam Warlock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Remember that guy from the post credit scene all the way back in 2017? I swear, he was just the guy that all of those fan theories were probably going crazy about, that he was probably going to help us in the battle against Thanos, or maybe even join with Thanos. I, I, I don't know, I wasn't a fan theorist, but instead we got this. Is that like a personal attack or something? Oh man, uh, I love you, Plank. It's just so easy sometimes. Anyway, following the attack from Adam Warlock on the new Guardians HQ on the head of nowhere, with Rocket being critically injured in the battle and with our Guardians not being able to operate due to a self-destructing bomb implanted in Rocket's chest, the Guardians are set on a life-saving and intensely time-crunching task to seek out Rocket's creator, the High Evolutionary. Diving deeper and deeper into 
the twisted dark path of his creation, as well as meeting up and recruiting the help of some familiar but unfamiliar faces along the way. But with the immense power and the cosmic hold that the high evolutionary has on the universe, as well as the pure destructive power of Adam Warlock on their tails, will the Guardians of the Galaxy be able to save Rocket in time, and will the Guardians be able to make it out of their most dangerous mission yet? You see, when it comes to the Guardians of the Galaxy, the success really lies with the fact whether your audience likes these characters or not. As I said before, all of the Guardians films are pretty much character-driven stories, and while the first was more of an origin story to really kick it all off, if you like these characters, then these films are really going to work for you, and are going to make you feel every part of whatever emotion the story wants you to feel at that specific moment. And when it comes to Volume 3, it's been quite a long time since we've had a backstory told as powerful and as dark as Rocket. It's interesting that we as a society have this sort of unwritten rule that while fictional torture or mayhem of humans is somewhat normalized, and in reality, we had a whole era relatively recently where that genre of film was praised, even. Compare that to, say, the same type of experience and experiments done on animals. It's pretty much always guaranteed to give you that sick-to-your-stomach feeling. It just doesn't sit right in the brain. So when describing earlier how I didn't really expect the MCU to dive this deeply into the horrors of animal cruelty was a pretty intense experience to say the least, and unfortunately, for lack of better words, were the most highlighted and impactful scenes of the entirety of the movie. Rocket's transcendence from backyard homegrown raccoon in North America to one of the smartest intellectual beings in the universe was not only dark and disturbing, surrounded by loss of his friends and lies from his creator, to someone that is not only surrounded by family, but an intellectual being that found himself protecting the galaxy from other maniacal galaxy-controlling titans such as his own creator, is one of the best full-circle character arcs that we've seen in the MCU since Tony and Cap. The character development and character dynamic that his character and the High Evolutionary are able to display on screen in a matter of a couple hours is nothing short of incredible, and while obviously that was aided and somewhat could be a testament to how powerful the on-screen display of Rocket's past was for us the audience, it wouldn't have been nearly as heart-wrenching and stomach-churning without the incredible performance of Chuck Woody Awuji as the High Evolutionary. Alright, at this point since it's already been the weekend, this isn't really a hot take. But with the releases of Ant-Man Quantumania and Guardians Volume 3 in such close succession, it was pretty inevitable that the comparisons between Kang and the High Evolutionary were going to make its way into the forefront of conversations. And while it's hard to say if Marvel wanted that, or planned that, or planned for Ant-Man Quantumania to be so dog shit, but the High Evolutionary is pretty much a better on-screen MCU Kang in every way, shape, or form. Acting-wise, better. Motives, while sick and disturbing, they're more interesting. Better character dynamics and tie-ins to the characters within the story being introduced, and honestly, just a more engaging introduction to a sick but powerful character as a whole. There's no anti-hero villain type of twist that seems to have been plaguing Marvel recently, and that's not even talking about just the big screen. From Wanda to Carly to Echo lady loki shang chi's dad and most recently with namor the anti-hero has subsided the generally dark and twisted villain of the mcu and well not anymore at least hopefully the high evolutionary is a sick and twisted villain a genius with the ocd fixation on rocket and a god complex issue of not liking how the universe is and with the power and the mind to change it for what he deems as perfect he'll get that done no matter the method and in this case, you guessed it, with rapid pace evolution. What is going on? Then, with all of the horrors that you've been subjugated to and seen throughout Rocket's flashbacks, and what the current High Evolutionary has been able to accomplish throughout the time of Rocket's disappearance from his grasp, it's pretty great to watch our heroes give the character what he deserves for the crimes that he's committed, and actually have a heroic ending to a superhero film every once in a while, without any unnecessary lessons or contrivances. It's just a regular old ass beating. It's just so refreshing. With the High Evolutionary and the development of Rocket's character being at the forefront of this movie, it's understandable that I was going to focus on it first and for the most part in this video. 
But that's not to say that that's all this movie had to offer, like so many others might suggest. Mantis, Drax, Nebula, Groot, and Star-Lord are all still incredible characters. And at this point, their chemistry is so seamless on the screen that you truly feel and believe that these characters are a family. Even the newest editions of Nebula and Mantis, the character banter and normal quips of dialogue keep you so engaged, like, this is how people actually talk, compared to... This small, small girl, I am going to give you two options. You can come to Wakanda, conscious or unconscious. You need to be conscious of the way that you look, walking around here with that ash on your head. <laughs> The only issue I felt like I really had, and I guess it was the same issue that I'm seeing the majority of people bring up with this film, and that's Adam Warlock. While my complaints personally might not be the same as some of the others that you've been hearing on the wasted potential of his character, I would like to say that I'm more disappointed and honestly would love to know if this was always the plan. His tease and potential hinting of his introduction was set up all the way back in 2007, as I said. And was this the plan to have him show up in 2023 as a side quest villain? It's hard because obviously it seems like a nitpick. But in reality, I can't even confidently say that our Guardians even knew who he was through the entirety of the movie. He was just an obstacle in the way of our main characters achieving their main objective. But not even like a wingman type to the bad guy. He was literally just a stepping stone on the way to success. Like the latter in Mortal Kombat, but imagine like the second challenge, not even the ninth. I swear he was basically like the messenger from the 300. I swear, I don't think any of our characters even knew who he was. So thrown to the wayside that the movie wouldn't have been affected in any way, shape, or form if his character wasn't in the movie at all. And it's very unfortunate because now he's just in the MCU as some guy. It's a very confusing and frankly, it's an interesting route to take a character of this caliber in the comics to just make him another dude. And with him being just basically a guy, it pretty much just makes the entirety of the Sovereign storyline from the previous movies pretty much seem obsolete and meaningless in the grand scheme of things. But with all of that in mind, I enjoyed and believed that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was the best MCU film to date since Endgame. Yes, even more than Spider-Man fan service. It's pretty easy to just bring back Willem Dafoe and Tobey Maguire to keep me engaged in your otherwise rather formulaic Spider-Man movies. It's another thing to introduce completely new and not as mainstream characters with a completely new and fresh but untested formula and tone. And to finish it all off in such a way with great character arcs and in a way with such grace and craft that the preceding trilogy could be argued as one of the best and well-constructed and well-received trilogies in your juggernaut of a franchise is truly S-tier behavior. Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is a heart-wrenching, stomach-turning, and above all, an uplifting story about family. And without a couple of nitpicks here and there, I couldn't have asked for a better ending to some of the character stories that I received. And if you haven't watched, then I truly, highly, highly recommend. I want to thank you guys for watching the video and if you enjoyed then make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this future or otherwise there hasn't been a lot of praise from me when it comes to the mcu i mean i didn't even review ant-man quantumania at the time because of how god awful it was like i couldn't even formulate thoughts to be honest i might just go ahead and get back to that but in reality, comment down below how you felt about Guardians 3. Did you enjoy it? Did you not? Did you cry? Is this the best MCU trilogy of all time? Let me know in the comments below. As always, I have a YouTube short rating and review of this movie that just dives into the aspects of what actually makes a movie in a little bit more detail and, well, in less time. So feel free to go check that out. But otherwise... That's all the words I got for you today. Bye.